Open your Bible, please, to Revelation. We're continuing our, our study in, um, on the horizon, our, our study throughout the whole book of Revelation. And tonight in Revelation chapter 9, it's big trouble from the pit, or big trouble from the abyss, and, and we'll get into that in, in a second. But now that you've got your place in Revelation 9, hold your place and flip to the end of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22. I want to read a warning that I think applies especially to the kind of material that we're going to read tonight from the book of Revelation. It's the kind of material that a lot of people like to either skip over or discount. And you can't do that about anything in Scripture. But look at, at chapter 22, 22, I've got to aim it the right direction, 22, verse 18 and 19. And I want you to read it out loud with me if you would says, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That is important enough to read it one more time on our feet. Can we? Can we stand? And now this time, everyone who read it nearly silently, let's read it a little bit louder together. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Father, what we're going to read tonight is hard, very hard to hear, and uh, harder to just even dig down in and study in the horrific detail of it all. But Father, we want to, we want to take it to heart as well and allow this part of your word to do what you intended it to do in our hearts in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. So, what we just highlighted is, is what I think you could call dangerous math. Dangerous, da how many of you are absolute math lovers? Any math lovers here? Oh, come on. And, and, no, my math skills go about as far as Sudoku puzzles. That's, that's about it. But how many of you are math haters? Or just, you, you suffer through math. This is, this is very, all joking aside, this is very, very dangerous math. And the math is this. The subtraction is, you're saying, God didn't really mean that. Or maybe you're saying, God didn't even really say that. We've misinterpreted it. We've looked at it wrong. We've, it's, it's been mistranslated. That's the subtraction side. We're just taking it out. It could even just be, like I said, ignoring it altogether. The addition is where you add to the Bible and you take away the meaning of it. And you take away the force of it and the weight of it. The words we're going to read tonight from chapter 9 are very, very weighty words. Addition is where a, a preacher, not even necessarily a preacher, Somebody will say, well, let me tell you what God really meant when he said that. It's not as bad as you think it is. Now, there's some passages, and I've been honest with you, when I come to them, I don't know exactly what they mean. And there's one notorious for me, when, when you come to that, the, and, and we've talked about it recently, pardon me if you need to for my repetition, but when Jesus says, after teaching us to pray, comes out of that lesson on prayer, and he says, if you don't forgive, Others, their trespasses. And your father won't forgive you yours. I'm not sure what all that means. And I say this, and I'm not joking when I say it. I don't know what it means, but it doesn't sound good to have something that God is not forgiving me for. Even if it's just a blockage in our relationship, it's powerful. And the words that we're going to read tonight are very, very powerful as well. There, there's more dangerous math, I think, done on the judgment passages of Scripture than anywhere else. And you don't need to be a, a, a preacher of the Word of God to, to violate that, that commandment that we read or, or that warning we read at the end. If you take away or if you add, then you end up the big loser. 
And so we want to let God say everything that he said. Amen? Amen. Don't add to the word of God. Don't subtract from the word of God. Let it say what it says. The faithful Christian, whether they're a preacher or not, must let God say what he said and relay what God has said faithfully to those that they love and, and those that they meet. Don't dare add a breath to what God has said. And don't dare take a breath away from what he has said. I want you to see a quote from John Piper. I know a lot of you love his preaching and uh, and his his books as well. But, oh, by the way, that one, I was supposed to share that one with you earlier. Where is that? What happened to that? Did I not put it up there? Maybe I didn't put it up there. I didn't put it up. Let me read it to you. This will work just as well. John Piper, I know I put it up there. It's there somewhere. John Piper said this. If you alter or obscure the biblical portrait of God in order to attract converts, just soften it up. In order to attract converts, you don't get converts to God. You get converts to an illusion. This is not evangelism. This is deception. This is deception. Let God say what he said. And then what my pastor said, I'll find it. (laughs) Pastor Chuck used to love to say, just simply teach the word simply. Just simply teach the word of God, simply to the people of God. Well, we're in those chapters that get edited, I think, quite often, difficult and uncomfortable truth, and and especially that truth about future, you have to agree, future severe judgment that's coming upon the earth. And um, after the terrible events of what we read in chapter 8, as we began to hear the trumpet blasts that just unroll another level of judgment that's coming to the earth, you, you could ask yourself, how much worse could it get? There was the earth and that, that was, was hit in the first trumpet blast with hail and fire and blood, and a third of the trees, the vegetation, were destroyed. And the second one, a third of the sea life dies, and, and a third of the ships that were out on the sea, they're destroyed. Maybe it's because of, of where that catastrophe happens. And, and then in the, the third one, the third trumpet, the rivers and the streams, a third of the fresh water supply, it's, it's just gone. And in the last one we looked at um, last week, it happens in the skies. A third of the life-giving natural light has been dimmed from the skies. And you just wonder how much worse can get this get? Well, there's three more trumpeters to blast. And, and these are the ones that come up under the category of the three woes. Everybody say, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it's not W-O-A-H, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's woe as in terrible, as in bad stuff that's coming. Now, we're in Revelation chapter 9 tonight. So if you'd turn there with me, I won't make you stand again. Tell somebody, thank God, he's not going to make us stand again. I want to read to you from verse 1 down to verse 12, and then we'll talk about these coming judgments. Verse 1 says, Then the fifth angel sounded, And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him, notice to him, not to it, but to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts are like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. I, I, I looked on, on Google for images of the locust of the book of Revelation. Half of them look like Alice Cooper, and I just didn't want to put those images in front of you, but when you, you put all of these different elements together, the the artist's conception is just all over the map on what these look like. And this is, again, John doing his best to describe what he's seeing at that point. Hair like women's hair, teeth like lion's teeth, verse 8, verse 9. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And this, this is intriguing. The sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions. 
and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past, thank God. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. One woe is past, more trouble still coming. The fifth seal, or the fifth trumpet, brings about this pain. It's just pain. It's not any more death at this point. It's just pain. There's this falling star. There's the bottomless pit. The, the Greek word behind it is uh, abyss or abuso, just this bottomless pit. There's these weird locust-like things and just agony, agony, pain, it says, for five months. So there's this falling angel, locust, pain, and all that. And names were given. There's a couple of names. Names have meaning, don't they? How many of you thought long and hard before you named your child? Anybody do that? We did that. I think we did okay. It was interesting that, you know, Bethany's name comes out of the Bible. Jeremy's name comes out of the Bible, I think in the King James, and it's a New Testament version of Jeremiah. So both of those were out of the Bible. And the name Shannon is not a biblical name. It's a name of a beautiful river in Ireland, and I'm Irish. Somebody asked us when we just had the three children, they said, were you guys backslidden when Shannon was born? And they were serious. We thought about the names that we named our kids. I want to put a few names up here for you. Again, if it will work. Do I have to? Okay. al Mizar. Read these with me. <laughs> if I got to read them, you got to try, okay? Alioth, Megrez, Fad, Merak, Dubey. Okay, ready? Next one. Kokab, Therkad. You're not even trying. I hear three people. Three people. Third one. Eta, Erse, Zeta, Erse, Epsilon, Yildun, and Polaris. You know what those are? Anybody know what those are? Those stars. What are they stars of? No. Nope. Well, they're, at, they're, 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 I guess we're in the Milky Way because we're in it. They're the names of the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. And I didn't know this until today, that at the cup of the, bo- of the far cup, you could go off the handle, work your way around over to Dubai, and the line from Merzat to Dubai goes straight out and almost hits Polaris. Did you know that's the way to find the the, um, the North Star, which is, by the way, the name Polaris. This, this star that we're seeing fall from heaven, it has a name. All those stars out there have names. By the way, I, I know that a while back, they opened up the, the heavens for you to, to name a star. Did anybody get a name for a star? Is there anybody here that owns the name of a star? I wondered how many people would pay that, to have the name floating out in space somewhere. But in all these names, and the names that we're looking at tonight, Apollyon and Abaddon, they have meaning, and we'll get into that just a little bit later. But this fallen star that we're looking at, this fallen star, it's not a big ball of gas. It's a person. It's a, it is not a big ball that hits the oceans again. This is, it has personhood, I should say, because it's not a person as in human. I believe that it's either Lucifer or it's another maybe high-ranking ferocious angel that fell from heaven that now is known as the angel of the bottomless pit. Not angel as in good angel. There's good angels and there's bad angels. The bad ones, obviously, are the fallen angels. But this one is, I believe, again, it's either Satan or it's that, an, another fallen angel, angel. But this star has been given authority given authority by God, that it didn't have until God says, you can do this. It's like a star or this angel on a leash. And God says, so far, no further. God is still the God of all the universe. This star has been given authority, given the key of the abyss, the key of the bottomless pit. Seven times you'll find that word bottomless pit or uh, abyss, if you have a different translation, in the book of Revelation. In, uh, in chapter um, 11 and 17, two times, and it's with these beasts rising out of the abyss. And in chapter 20, two times with the abyss being locked up by another angel who now has the key to, to imprison, again, all of this wickedness down in the bottomless pit. Most of the times that you see the word abyss in the book of Revelation, though, it's right here in chapter 9 where it's talking about all this bad stuff that comes up out of the bottomless pit, the abyss. 
that if, if you are, you know, Bible students and you read, read the Bible a lot, you know there's other places in Scripture where the abyss is mentioned. And, and in the New Testament, in the Gospels, there's this incredible account of Jesus going across the Sea of Galilee, and he walks into the equivalent of a, a, a modern-day cemetery, caves where the, that have become tombs, and he sees this guy who's demon-possessed, he's running around naked, and there's chains, or the remainders of chains dangling from his wrist, and the man comes running up to Jesus, throws himself down, and in one account, it says, the man said to him, don't torment me. In the Matthew account, it's the demons inside of him that are saying, don't torment us before the time. Don't send us into the abyss. Don't send us into the bottomless pit. It was recognized that by those demons that Jesus wrangled with or that Jesus confronted that they had a destiny where they would be locked up once and for all for all eternity, and that, that eternal punishment was coming. So if you put together what you get in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 8, it would read something like this. Don't cast us into the abyss to torment us before the time. They know that their torment is coming, that their eternal torment is coming. But verses 2 and 3, and you can go back and, and read those yourself, this pit is open. And I think the, the, the story unfolds, and it pretty much describes itself. There's very, very little interpretation that's needed. But in, in verses 2 and 3, once this angel of the bottomless pit, I, I think it's something demonic, rises up, here's the smoke and these locusts ascend, probably literal smoke. And the sun and the air are darkened again, more extreme air pollution, worse than the San Joaquin Valley. Anybody ever lived out in the San Joaquin Valley? They say it is one of the most dangerous, toxic places to live in America because of all of the pesticides and herbicides and fertilizer that's put in there, and the winds come and move it around the bowl of the San Joaquin Valley. This will be polluted far beyond that. And all of this toxic stuff that's up in the air, you just don't want to be here. I'll say more about that at the, uh, at the end of our time together tonight. But it just terrible smoke that just rises up. I, I, think it's, I think it's literal smoke. I don't think these are literal bugs or literal insects. I, I, I just don't think they are. I think they're probably more like something demonic, another demonic creature, maybe even deformed down through the millennia that is just let loose to attack a rebellious, important to get that distinction, a rebellious generation that has fought against God with all that they're worth. They're like locusts, it says, and they rise up through the smoke, and the locust, I, don't, I didn't mean this to sound like a rhyme, the locust is the focus here. The locust of the focus, at least in the, the fifth trumpet as it sounds. They have power like a scorpion. What does a scorpion do to you? It stings. How does it feel? Thank God I don't know what it feels like. But I hear that it's just horrible pain, and it depends on the scorpion too, the, the kind of scorpion that it is. We saw lots of them living out in the desert. You turn over a rock, you turn it over carefully, and you, when you walked outside at night, you put your shoes on because you don't want to step on one of those. But it says it has a sting that's like a scorpion, power to inflict pain, but not authority to kill. But the authority to give five months of pain. I had a question about this. Did it mean that whoever got stung hurt for five months from the sting? Or is it saying, and I think this might be more the case, that for five months they had this long leash to do their stinging for five months. So somebody might have got stung over and over and over again. That pain, can you imagine that repetitive pain of all of that? And so they're, they're, they're kind of roaming what's left of the population of the earth. There's five months of swarming and stinging people. It's kind of like the locust in, uh, in the book of Exodus. But those locusts didn't have the sting. But it's again, it's just a plague that is sent from God on a rebellious generation, just like the plagues were sent on Egypt because of one rebellious leader. And that spilled over to, to his whole nation that he was supposed to be watching over. Well, verses 4 to 6 give you the limitation of the locust. They don't hurt the vegetation. That's interesting. Enough, enough damage to the crops and the vegetation of the earth. So they don't touch any of the green stuff. They, they don't hurt the 144,000, those who have been sealed or marked by God 
as his witnesses on the planet at that point. They're already believers, and God says, just don't touch my people that are here serving my purpose. It's another means to get the attention of unbelievers, I think. Well, it's, how, how many of you came to Christ in a time of some sort of pain? He said, the, the only one I know to cry out to is God. I think a lot of us are moved more by, by emotional pain, mental pain, psychological pain, you know, disappointment. And we run to God and say, you know, I, I've made a mess out of my life and I need your help. But there's all kinds of pain that make people cry out to Christ. Um, you guys know the story of Caitlin Dubrow and, um, and how when, when she was suffering through that horrible time in her life from the spinal meningitis, and many of you maybe don't know Caitlin, but she lost this arm up to the shoulder, this arm just below the elbow, and both legs just below the knees, 60% of the skin that was left. And she said, that's what brought me to Christ. That's what, would I like my, my limbs back? Well, of course, but thank God, she said, that it opened my eyes. It led me to Christ. God uses, he can use anything that hits us if it's used to turn our, our hearts to him. It's just another means, I think, to get the attention of unbelievers. God, remember when God wrestled with Jacob? And what did he do to Jacob? And, and, Put his hip out of joint for how long? Rest of his life. The Bible says he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. And every other step in his life was a reminder that God loved him enough to wrestle him to the ground. And I, I, I don't think he cursed the limp that brought him to that point of surrender to God. You, you probably know this verse in Hosea chapter 6. Let's read together. He says, Come, let us return to the Lord for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Oh, I know a lot of people that don't like that, that, that kind of talk in Scripture, but it's all over Scripture. God loves us enough to block our path and bring us to the place where we will say, not uncle, don't cry uncle, cry father. Cry out to him for mercy. You have torn, Lord. If you've torn, then you will heal and you've stricken, and you'll bind up. And I, I just love the fact that over and over again through the Scripture, the most often repeated invitation is just God saying, come here, just come to me. It's a relationship, come to me. And if you haven't done that yet, do that, do that tonight. But here the locusts, on their limitations, they cannot kill. Satan cannot take our life without God's permission. He can't have anything to do with it. Unless God, for some reason, allows him to be the vessel that moves us home to God. It's important to remember two powerful statements in Scripture. One, where God says, I take no delight at all. No delight in the death of the wicked. You know, we, we get happy. Now, I, I remember when I heard about Osama bin Laden. Finally, they caught up to him. Something in me rejoiced like God doesn't rejoice. It didn't make God happy for a man like Osama bin Laden or for Hitler to take his own life, if that's what happened there. But God says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. For the same reason you love it when your kids come home. God loves it when his kids come home. And for us to get from here to heaven until the rapture, every single saint before us that's gone to heaven has gone through that door of death to be with Jesus. So Satan can't take a life unless God uses him as an instrument to do that. And then I think if God allows that, I think it's just poetic. It's, maybe justice is not the right word there. I should have thought this through to find a better word. But it's just like the enemy thinks, oh, I got him, but he didn't get us. Because all he did was sort of, you know, maybe kicked us through a door. And where do we end up? But in the absolute, beautiful, full, perfect presence of God. And I don't belittle death. Death is hard. But all of this, keep this in mind. All of this has a redemptive purpose. All of, of, of these judgments that are being poured out upon the earth, you're going to see it at the end of the chapter. You probably already read it. Every single one of these is to cause people to cry out to God from their hearts. And then in verses 7 to 10, well, we read it, and I don't know how to describe it except to give you the bullet point list of it again. It's just the description 
of these locusts. I don't think they're helicopters. I remember back in, in the 70s, somebody said, were well, the wings that sound like chariots rattling down the, the road, maybe they're helicopters, Russian helicopters. And I, I just don't think they're helicopters or robots. It says they're like horses ready for battle. They have some kind of a crown on their head, he said, that looks like gold. Faces like men, hair like women, teeth like lions, breastplates of iron, wings that sound like chariots with many horses in battle. <laughs> Thank you, John, for putting all this down and writing down what he didn't completely understand, but what he saw. He said they have scorpion tails and they eat no greens like locusts do. And they seem, I, like I said, to me, I... I I really believe that what we're seeing is this gnarly description of some sort of a demonic presence that's being used to accomplish God's purposes. And it's uh, something beyond anything Spielberg could ever imagine or Stephen King could ever dream up. It's, it's, it's worse. It's worse. The real creatures enrage but, but, uh, but not turn totally loose because they can't do whatever they want to do. They can only do what God allows them to do. And it's interesting, it says they have a king. Locusts don't have a king. Proverbs says that. The locusts, they have got no king. They have no leader. And this king, back to the name of this king, this king, this fallen angel, has a name. And that name, you, you read it there, name is in two languages, in Hebrew and in Greek. And they mean very, very similar things. Apollyon means the perishing. I wonder if that's a name that God gave to this angel who will perish. Whether it's Lucifer or whether it's another angel or Abaddon, destroying, not destroying, but destroying. I knew there'd be a typo up there. There's always a typo up there because I do the typing on my own stuff. But this is, again, Lucifer, some other fallen angel. So moving on from number five, I want you to go with me to verses 13 to 21. And we'll take a look at the sixth trumpet. It's about to sound. And when it sounds, this is bad. Verse 16. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 13. Now the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying the sixth angel who had the trumpet, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Again, these are probably fallen angels, because good angels don't have to be tied up. Good angels are not bound. Good angels obey God. But these ones are bound at the four corners, or at the great river Euphrates. And so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. And those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone, these three plagues. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. We'll save verse 20 and 21 for just a little bit. The sixth trumpet is global destruction. One third of mankind has died. You would have to, to believe that that's one third of what's left from those who have already died. And we're going to do some more sad math here in just a little bit. But the voice of judgment, this voice that comes from the altar, it's not Alexa. This is the Lord speaking. And the voice of God that says, release those four angels that I've been holding back. They've been prepared for this moment. It's a voice of judgment to let them go. They were assigned to this. They were prepared for this. Fallen angels, destroyers, under the leadership of this, uh, this <laughs> demonic angel of the bottomless pit. Faithful angels are not tied up, like I said. These are fallen angels. Verse 15 through 19 is a picture of these hordes. You got four, it's like four generals. This is a, a, a massive sort of uh, imbalance of, of leadership. Four generals over 200 million horsemen. And again, whatever these 
horsemen are as they're described. It's a little bit mysterious, and John's doing his best to describe it. Are they human? Are they demonic? People used to say 200 million. And back in the 70s again, when we thought that the locusts were helicopters, the word was kind of circulating. And and it was circulating because China at that time in the mid-70s boasted that they could front an army of, guess how many? 200 million. And so everybody thought, it's going to be China that's going to be coming. And and it's it's there. But, But still these horsemen or whatever they're in, it just just doesn't look human enough to me. I could be wrong. Um, We'll have to see, I guess you'd say, from a distance what that is, because I don't believe we're going to be here personally to see that. So whether it's human or demonic or whether it's biological or some sort of mix of biological and technological, we just don't know. And if anybody tells you they know for sure, I've just got to tell you, I doubt that. I really doubt it. Um, I I don't think we have an absolutely exact description that will satisfy everybody's curiosity. By the way, how many of you want to know more? How many of you want to know? I want to know everything about these. Well, God hasn't given us everything. He's given us here snapshots. And they're not the kind of snapshots that make you say, oh, I want to go there for vacation. (laughs) Terrible snapshots of the devastation and the death, the ruin that's going to hit this planet at that time. John's describing what he sees within the boundaries of his own experience. And he says there's more fire and there's more smoke. And just like Sodom and Gomorrah, there's more brimstone. It comes down from heaven as a judgment. And the terrible result is a third of mankind is gone. Now, a third of what's left of mankind. Here's the math. Look at this. More sad math. Earth's population right now. Let's say this happened now. We're about 7.442 billion. I just did the math off the 7.44. Is that enough for everybody? Is that close enough for you for tonight? When you go to Revelation chapter 6, 25% of that, if it happened now, would be 1.86 billion gone like that. That's a quarter of the Earth's population now, and they're gone. And then that would mean there's 5.58 billion that survived from what we saw in Revelation chapter 6 verse 8. You move to Revelation 9, where we are here, verse 15, and then a third of what's left is gone. That's another 1.84 billion more, almost identical numbers to what came before. And so those numbers, whatever it would be on earth when all of this begins, it would come down to this, that it almost takes half of the population of the earth away. That's 3.6 billion out of the one point, uh, out of the 7.4 billion Half of them survived to that point. Here is to me what is absolutely incredible and so hard to believe. Look at verse 20 and 21. After this, it says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. Why? Why would anybody worship demons like that at this point? Well, you know what? Maybe the logic is something like this. We want to get on the right side of these that are bringing all the death. And if they are demons, maybe that's what would motivate people to to somehow worship these demons demonic presences that are, are, are beings that are bringing this devastation. I just, I can't make my mind logically go to the point where at that point in history, after half of the population of planet Earth has been taken, that you would worship at the feet of the demons. But there's more that they do. It's not just the idolatry. It says, verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries, the witchcraft, which would include uh, drug use. The, the, the word behind sorcery is pharmakia. We get our word pharmacy from that. And there's the notion that it always involves some sort of concoction, some sort of potion in the worship of these demons. They don't repent of their idolatry, their murder, their sorceries, or their sexual immorality. And that's a broad term covering all sexual immorality as defined in Scripture. Or their thefts. So it's just anarchy. On the planet, still, it's anarchy. On the planet, 
when they've seen, I believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God has something to say. Here's 144,000 witnesses that are witnessing everywhere they can uh, uh, the gospel. They're preaching the gospel. They're telling people you can be saved. Turn your heart to Christ. And many of those that, that receive Christ will be martyred for their faith during the tribulation period. We're in the deep into the worst part of that seven-year period that this, this world is going to see. The, the worst part of it, we're, I think we're right in the heart of it at this point. And yet it says, and I, you have to take it this way, that by and large, predominantly, most people say, no. They just say, no, I'm not interested. No, I don't want God meddling with my life. Even the God that's bringing that judgment, even the God who's trying to nudge us toward the door of the kingdom, which is, which is Christ, here, here's, here's God again at the end of chapter 9, giving people another call to come to me. Just come to me. What does it take to make us get right with God? I, I, we could go around the room and, and fess up to one another. This is what it took me to get right with God. After my, you know, people said, well, you had your fun. It's easy to talk about it. I, I honestly, this is not cliche. When, when I look back at my fun, it was not fun. It was anything but fun. It was horrible and hellish the years that I ran from Jesus Christ. I would, I would play my games and do my partying and go home and close my eyes and wonder why can't I make life work for me. There wasn't any fun in it. Now, all the stupid drugs I poured into my body, I, I cannot tell you I ever had one, as we used to say, good trip. Not one. It was anxiety. It, it left me for a solid year. I, I know I've shared this with this congregation. But for one solid year, I could not close my eyes without having just vivid, crazy hallucinations. For one solid year. The last one I remember, I was in the San Joaquin Valley. It had nothing to do with the pollution in the San Joaquin Valley. <laughs> I was laying down in a park waiting to go through the doors of a courtroom to show them that I had fixed my mutilated license that I got a ticket for when I was hitchhiking through. So I was in series, and I was laying in the park there, waiting for the courtroom to open, and I heard a train go by, and I, I just sort of rolled my head over, and I looked, and I saw the train do like a big loop-de-loop -loop and just keep on going. And it was like, whoa, Jesus, take this away from me. And right after that, it was gone. And it's never come back. I know some of you wonder if I still hallucinate. No, no, I don't. I know I do some crazy things. But I thank God for that, that, that year reminder to not go back to what had been terrible and frightening and so destructive. What does it take to, to make us say yes to Jesus? I want to wait till I have my fun. I, you know, I, I, I've got stuff to do. I just, I don't want to see you at the end of your life. Like I saw a friend of mine. Um, today, I, I, I called a friend who called me yesterday, Rob Mel. Some of you remember him. He came here and sang. And I remember his dad. I can't remember Mr. Mel's name. But I, I remember his dad came to Christ when he was on his deathbed. And I got to pray with him to receive Jesus. And I got to speak at his memorial service. But... Uh, I will never forget, he said what I've heard so many say, why didn't I come sooner? Why did I waste so much of my life on something that means nothing to me now? I, I just, I just want to beg you tonight. I'll beg for Jesus. I want to beg you to come to him and find the life that he created you to have. Somebody said last night at this event that I went to, I really believe, I really believe that revival has started in Orange County. Well, I hope that it has, but it can start for you tonight. If you'll say, Jesus, take what's left of my life and mean it and pray. And the Bible says, call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Does it take more? Is it going to take something like this? You're going to wait till the church disappears and then say, well, I guess it's real. Okay, I'll pray. And then you've got to live through this mess come to him now if you hear that beating in your heart right now then now is the time to come now is the time to surrender 
um, these souls that we've been reading about, these, the people that are left after the church has been taken, they'll have a chance. They'll have a choice. But right now, tonight, you have a choice. And you can say yes to Jesus, or you can say later to him, which is like saying no to him for a while. You don't want to say no to him. You want to say yes to him. The heavens declare the glory and the power of God, but during the great tribulation, even his wrath, as it's poured upon this earth, it's going to declare his glory too. It's going to declare his power. It's going to show his wrath and his holiness. And you don't have to be here for that. No one, by the way, no one, you don't hear anybody in Scripture during that great tribulation raising their fist to God and saying, not fair, God. Not fair. This is not just because they know it's just. I want you to see this one more time. I, I showed this to you last week. I want you to read it with me again. God will judge because God must judge because God is just and holy and fair. Now, those are my words, but let me give you some better words, okay? They're from God's Word. And in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, let's read together. Far be it from you to do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of the earth do right? What's the answer to that? Yes, of course. The judge of the earth always does what's right, even when you see this level of judgment. But let me have you turn as we close to one more passage. I don't have it up there on the screen, but it's in your Bible. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Oh, I got to tell you, these are not my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. In our devotion today, uh, one of our staff, uh, Katie, did a, a beautiful devotion, just kind of reading through Romans 8. Anybody love Romans 8? Oh, I love Romans 8. Anybody love John chapter 3? Love that chapter. I love preaching from that. These are not my favorite verses that we've been reading in Revelation, but I do love this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, follow along with me, mark up your Bible, please, in these passages. It says, but concerning the times and the seasons, that's the coming of the Lord, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. That's what we've been reading in the book of Revelation. Paul is saying, you know as much as I know. I, I'm not keeping any secrets from you. I've told you all I can tell you. And then he says this, it comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all, he's writing to Christians, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. What could he say there? We used to be. And then let me see the hands of those that used to be darkness. I, interesting, it doesn't say you just used to be in darkness. He said, you were darkness. I contributed to the darkness of the world. All those years I ran from and rebelled against God. You're not, you are sons of light. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Verse 6. Therefore, let's not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. That means sober in both ways. Stay sober. Don't be a drunkard and keep awake. Take this seriously, he's saying. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God, if you would read verse 9 and 10 with me, that would be great. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. You know why I believe that the church is absent on the earth? during the great tribulation period? I think Paul just explained it right there. He said, we are not appointed to what we read about in chapter, what, 7 
through about chapter 18, 19, those horrific years on the planet. We're not appointed to the wrath of God that's going to hit the planet. We have been appointed to receive salvation. The rapture of the church happens before all of this starts. And it can be your future too. If you, if you receive Jesus, if you open your heart to him and you allow him to come in and take over, and then he says this. Let me read it once more. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus, who died for us. Here's how salvation comes. He died for us, that whether we, live, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So comfort each other with these words. You that have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, comfort one another with these words that we will obtain salvation. We will rise from a planet that's about to be judged because of the darkness. And it's on everybody's mind. And on everybody's mind. You see these three articles right here? They're not really articles, they're ads. These three ads were in different sections of the same newspaper on, on Resurrection Weekend in the USA Today. And every single one of these articles filled with, articles or ads, whatever you want to call them, filled with small print, are telling us the end is near. Now, a couple of them are seven-day Adventists telling you you better worship on the right day. And, and one of them is a different seven-day Adventist saying you got the, the other seven-day Adventists, they got the, the day wrong. It's really actually this day. The calendars are all, are all messed up, but it's on people's minds enough that this is showing up in the papers all the time in these days. And, and, and we, don't need the, we don't need USA Today to remind us. We have the authoritative word of God that says, listen, believe, trust, surrender, and live. And live and escape the judgment of God. Starting when? Right now. Right now. I want you to pray with me as we close. And I want to encourage you to, as I said, comfort each other and then commit yourself to telling other people that their sins can be forgiven and they can live forever with God in heaven. So Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the honest truth in your word. And Lord, it's, it's hard to read these things. It's hard to imagine these things. The thought of half of the population of this planet perishing needlessly and only because of rebellion and refusing to simply believe. Father, I just pray that you would use us to be a voice in this generation at this time to call people to come to life in Christ. And so, Father, I pray that even right now tonight, if there's anybody in here that is iffy or wondering about their salvation, wondering if they, if they are saved, wondering if they've said enough, done enough, or behaved enough to be saved, Father, I pray you re would relieve them from that burden tonight as they simply trust in Jesus, turn from their sins, and allow you to be their forgiver and their life giver. And Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that there would be a revival that would happen right here tonight in the hearts and souls of those who respond to Jesus right now. Thank you, Father. I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes closed for a minute and to think about this. Just think about this question. Ask yourself this. Am I sure that I'm right with God? Am I sure that if Jesus were to call his people home, that I would go? And do I have a fear that I would be left? I want to ask you tonight a follow-up question to that. If you have that, that doubt or if you have that fear, I want to ask you, will you tonight settle that issue by surrendering your life to Jesus? We're going to do that with a prayer, but the words of the prayer are not magic. It's not just walking forward or standing up or saying the prayer out loud. It's turning your heart to Christ for salvation, Him and Him alone, and allowing Him to change your life as He enters your life to take over and show you a different way to live now. That's the most important decision you'll ever make, followed by a lot of, a lot of other important decisions, but it all starts here. I want to ask if there's anybody here tonight that would say this, Bill, I will, tonight, I will surrender my life to Jesus. I will do that right now. Maybe you haven't been sure up to this point and you want to be sure. You can be sure tonight. You can make that 
that heartfelt connection with Jesus, a serious commitment of your life to him. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? I want to pray with you before we close. God bless you right there in the middle and the back and a couple in the middle section toward the back. Anybody else right up here towards the front? God bless you. Anyone else tonight? Say, yeah, tonight I want to make sure I surrender to him. I see a hand up back there towards my right in the back. Yeah, God bless you. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. Okay. We're going to pray. The Bible says to do that. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You will be saved. So as we cry out from our hearts, I want to ask you just to, to say this prayer from your heart to your Father who is excited to hear from you right now. A prayer of surrender. Let's say this. You that raised your hand, let's say this out loud. I'll pray it with you. Let's pray like this. Father God, I thank you for Jesus Christ who suffered for my sins and died on a cross and rose from the dead to give me life. I want to be saved. I ask you to forgive my sins. Take my life, all of me. Live in me and show me how to live for you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for giving me life. The rest of my life is yours. In the beautiful name of Jesus, amen. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's stand together. Uh, those, I want, I want to ask this. I can't. I want to ask this. Any of you that just right now prayed a very focused commitment or recommitment of your life to Jesus, I want to ask you to raise your hand and wave it around right now because uh, I, I want the people around you to tell you, praise God. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Welcome. We applaud that. So, Father, for those that right now have raised their hands, those who have opened their heart, Lord, more than raising their hands, they've opened their heart to a Savior. And Lord, I believe on the basis of your word that you have cleansed them and you have given them new life. It's resurrection day for them, Lord. I thank you. Thank you, Father God, for April 11, 2018, and for new life revival that happened right here tonight, Lord. So, Father, would you bless them and comfort them, Father God, and give them strength now to live for you. As all of heaven celebrates that new life, so do we. So do we, Lord. We're so excited for what you've done here tonight, Lord. We embrace our new brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to sing right now. And there's a prayer team on both sides. These are prayer warriors up here, by the way. And if you want somebody to pray with you through something you're going through, there they are. You can pray with a believer that you came in with. All right, let's sing. Amen. Are you glad you came tonight? I mean, are you glad you know now? Is, is that, does all of that maybe motivate us a, a little bit more to let a few more people know that they're loved by a God who doesn't want to judge them. He wants to forgive them. He wants to give them life. Amen. And God bless you all. Grace and peace to you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.